Welcome back. An important vote in the United States House of Representatives this week on an infrastructure bill and a social programs bill that together cost almost $5 trillion. We talk with New Jersey Congressman Andy Kim about the bills and his upcoming vote and the opening of a veterans outpatient clinic in Ocean County. Congressman, uh, as always, thank you for your time. I know you are in district today. It's a busy day for you and congratulations. Uh, they've been talking about this for a long time. They have needed it for a long time. And finally, you're going to announce the construction of a veterans community outreach outpatient center. Um, and the and the VA se- the VA secretary is coming in to make the announcement with you, Neil McDonough. Talk about what this means. Uh, we're recording this on a Monday, I should say, and and so you even have you haven't even had the roundtable yet. Talk about what this means for the community and and what the need is. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, and, and thanks for raising this issue because this healthcare clinic for our veterans in Ocean County. This has been my top priority since day one of coming into Congress. What we see right now is a situation where the, the current facility at in Brick just unable to deal with the huge demand by the veterans. That clinic in Brick was designed for 2,500 patients. Right now, there are well over 10,000 patients uh, that use that. And there, there, there are many others that can't get access to it because uh, it, it's it's capped out there. So, you know, this has been a huge problem. I mean, even just basic things like parking on the side of the road, you know, seeing veterans, you know, Korea War, Vietnam War era veterans having to park on the side of the road and, and walk on in. Uh, it's it was it's it's been de- not only deeply disappointed, but frankly disgraceful in terms of serving them. So to have this new facility, which frankly has been talked about for years and years and years. So to finally have it, have it the contract uh, set uh, for Ocean County to know that it's on its way, it's gonna be a facility that is twice as large as the current facility, gonna have many more services as well so that veterans don't have to go all the way up to East Orange as often to the medical center there. It's going to do wonders and a huge importance for the veteran community. So I have to say I'm very happy that this announcement it can be made, and I appreciate Secretary McDonough coming to help me make that announcement through the veterans of the community. But we still have more work to do to make sure it stays on track and also to address the current problems that the veterans have. Right. Give some specifics. When will it be open? When can people use it? And exactly where is it going to be? Yeah, so it's going to be... Uh, in Tom's River, um, it's going to be in a, a location that's that's very central, a lot of public transit and other aspects like that. So I, I think that, uh, you know, that we're, we're happy about that. It's going to, if hopefully on track, uh, set for late 2023 or early 2024. So, um, so you know, certainly I'm going to do my best to, to kind of press on that and, and try to see if we can at least stay on track, if not move it up a bit, uh, but no guarantees on that front. Uh, but like I said, that also leaves us with a couple years here where we need to make sure that we're still following through on the current challenges that veterans are facing, which are real and significant, uh, to make sure that they get the care that they need and deserve. It is going to be an interesting week in the House of Representatives. The Senate is supposed to pass an infrastructure bill tomorrow over a trillion dollars. And then it is going to be delivered to the House. But the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, said she won't even consider that until she gets a reconciliation bill that's $3.5 trillion and has things for climate change and for home care and for health care, many, many social issues. And they're going to tie the two of them together. So there's a lot to work through here and there's a lot of moving parts. And again, we're recording this on Monday. But just in general, I imagine you're for the infrastructure bill, right? I'm certainly supportive of it, yes. You know, we still have to get the final bill. Um, you know, I, I like the direction that it's been going, uh, but I know the Senate still has to go through all of its amendment processes right now. So, you know, I'll take a close look at it when it's when it's finalized. But I've been encouraged by what I've seen so far. But there's a lot in it right now for New Jersey. That's certainly the hope. I mean, and this is something I need greater clarity on, you know, exactly you know, what is this? How, how do I look the people in my district in the eye and say, this is what's going to change? You know, this is what's going to improve. How, you know, so that's the kind of mechanism that I'm still 
trying to get a sense of in terms of, of how this is going to be divvied up, you know, what we can know for sure in terms of what, you know, New Jersey is going to get. But in terms of the broad buckets, I mean, you know, the, the kind of efforts that we need, for instance, there's, there's uh, currently funding in, in the infrastructure bill for dealing with resilience uh, infrastructure when it comes to resilience of, of climate and environmental issues. I mean, that's important for my district where, you know, we got crushed by Superstorm Sandy. We have flooding on like a daily basis here. Even on sunny days, we have this kind of flooding. Like we need to fix this. So that sounds very good, but I, I want to get a more specific sense. Like, can, is that something I know can be coming to New Jersey? Um, and, and that kind of effort is going to be important. All anybody thinks about when they think about infrastructure in New Jersey is the Gateway Project. And there's money for the Gateway Project in this bill, right? Yeah, well, the Gateway certainly is moving forward. Um, you know, and I, I know we've gotten the assurances from the Biden administration about that. And look, Gateway is big and we need to get it done. Um, and so, you know, we think about the whole delegation, bipartisan ways been focused on that. Uh, but, you know, look, my district's a little further down from, uh, from New York City and in Burlington County, Ocean County. I got to make sure, you know, Gateway is not the end all be all for us, you know, just just in and of itself. So, you know, I want to know, you know, what is it that we can do in, the, in my area? We have real problems when it comes to public transit. You know, we have a lot of people struggling to get around. And as I said, you know, we have a lot of issues of, of flooding. So I don't want people to just think, you know, New Jersey, they can just check the box just with Gateway. You know, there, there's other things that we need to make sure that we're focused on. And that's certainly something I'm thinking about a lot. Let's talk about the reconciliation bill now. Do you agree that the two should be tied together? I haven't been someone that has tied the two together. Um, you know, that's not something that I've talked about before or, or supported. What I will say is that um, I do think that there are elements like, for instance, like I'm very concerned about climate change, as mentioned by what I was just saying with Superstorm Sandy and other mm -hmm. issues. And the infrastructure bill gets at some of what it is that I want to see. But when we're dealing with a situation that, in my opinion, is a national security crisis, you know, I need to have a clear sense from the Senate and from this administration about what are they prepared to do? You know, what are what is it that we are going to tangibly get done? That doesn't necessarily mean it's about the reconciliation bill or any bill. It's about just what vehicle of legislation can we do to, to maximize this? So I want to have that kind of conversation and I want to have that kind of discussion in um, but, you know, for me, uh, I think I need to see what comes through in terms of infrastructure. I know the Senate is also putting together a budget resolution that is going to come over as well. So I'll take a look at those and, and see you know, where I stand. But the main thing that I'm focused on is just understanding what is it that's going to change in my district by the passage of infrastructure, by the passage of these other bills. And, you know, as I said, a, a, a big priority for me is about climate and getting a sense of what happens next on that. Is the price tag a priority for you? Is $3.5 trillion too much to be spending right now? Well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody that, that is careful about how the government spends. And, you know, I know that we're in a, a situation right right now that is unprecedented. Um, and I know with COVID and other issues, you know, I, I remember when I was on the select committee on the coronavirus crisis, talking to the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, you know, he was someone that, that, that helped me understand, you know, how is it that we move past some of these challenges right now? And he always said that, you know, look, we, we need to make sure we learn our lessons from 2008 and not uh, be too concerned such that it prevents our growth going forward. So what I'm saying is that uh, right now, I'm trying to figure out how is it that we can sustain our growth coming out of this pandemic and find a way to, to how would I describe it, just be able to maintain that recovery going forward and not have some sort of cliff later on. Uh, I'm, so I'm prepared for some spending. Now, the question, though, it isn't just about the price tag of the spending, but what kind of spending it is. So, for instance, I'm much more open to spending when it comes to infrastructure or resilience types of issues, because... Mm -hmm. I think that that kind of spending actually has a multiple fold effect within our community. You know, when we have spending in, in our community in that way, that can have a huge impact on our private sector, on our local communities, on our small businesses. So that's different um, kind of spending. So it's not just the price tag that I'm looking at, but what kind of spending it is. So you're not going to say right now how you would vote on either bill because you need to see the final bill. Yeah, you know, that that's kind of the promise. Well, that's that unique in Congress. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, I don't want to just be seen 
uh, you know, as, as sort of just, a, you know, just a, like a, you know, rubber stamp type thing to the Senate or to anything, you know, like we have our own jurisdiction in the House. Um, and I need to, you know, I have different equities at stake here than, than others do in terms of what's best for my district. So, uh, you know, I, I think that my district is, uh, it wants me to make sure that I take a close look at this. And whether it's the Chamber of Commerce I talked to the other day, or, you know, the, the local communities that I talked to uh, in, in Tom's River recently, or the veterans I'll talk to, um, you know, everybody wants to make sure that we're looking out for our district. Let's talk about the coronavirus real quick. And you mentioned the pandemic. What more can be done that's not being done? It seems like we've stalled. Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it's very frustrating to see where we're at right now, because you know, I, I think I, along with many others, you know, we felt earlier this summer that, you know, we were really turning the corner here and that, that we're in this, uh, you know, that we're in a, in a good trajectory. And, and Delta has really changed that calculus. I am trying to be very uh, careful about how we approach things because I, I don't want to get to the level right now where, where I, I am, um, you know, overly sounding any alarms, you know, I, I try to be data driven and try to focus on that. And, and yes, um, you know, the, the infection rates are higher now um, than they were a couple months ago. In fact, they were higher now than they were a year ago. Um, death rates are still something we're keeping an eye on. And, and I know they often lag uh, a couple weeks after the infection rates go up. So we'll see if that at least can kind of keep on the lower end because vaccinations are higher. I'm hoping so. Um, but um, it, it's it's really alarming and it's frustrating, you know, seeing this situation. And honestly, um, I don't know what's going to happen next when it comes to the fall and the winter and just how bad it's going to get. I'm hopeful when I see some of the data coming out of the UK and India and elsewhere that have gone through Delta spikes, where we've seen that, you know, come down uh, within a couple of weeks or, or a few months. So hopefully a similar ish trend happens here. Uh, but you, you can make no uh, assumptions about that. And, you know, there's also, you know, we see with the variants, you know, could be other variants down the road as well that uh, could be, even, you know, could be, con you know, uh, as big of a concern, if not worse. Um, so we just need to make sure we're staying vigilant. Do you see any scenario where you would support or it was even possible to have the fe a federal mandate of the vaccine? Oh, um I mean, that hasn't been something I've been, you know, thinking about. Like, I, I think that that would be, you know, when you see what is happening right now, um, I think that would be impossible to be able to implement. Um, and so what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, there are ways that we can try to get that as, as much as possible um, so that people can be addressing. I've talked to a number of people who are unvaccinated in my own district and some of them, you know, are, are people that, that, you know, are trying to get, you know, more data. They're, they're nervous about taking things so soon. Uh, and they're trying to understand about what happens next. A lot of them also on the younger side. So these are populations that with more intensive outreach, I do think we're going to be able to get those numbers up. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think that, that forcing uh, populations right now that are resistant is going to be the right thing to do, especially when this is still through an emergency use authorization. Um, you know, I, I, we have to understand we are in uncharted territory and waters when it comes to emergency use authorization. We've never used this before for a vaccine. So, um, you know, I, I know it's a tough one for folks, but, you know, I think there's at least things that we can do to try to move that needle up ahead. Let's talk about the midterms real quickly. I know it's a long way off. I'm sure you've thought about it a little bit, even though you don't really have an opponent yet. We haven't had primaries yet, but already they're handicapping the races and, and they've made your district, your seat, one of the most vulnerable in the country. And rather than get you to respond to that directly, I just want to talk to you about midterms in general, because it has to be frustrating, because I'm sure you believe you did your job the best you could. You're out there in the community all the time. You're out there again today. And a lot of it will have nothing to do with you. A lot of it is just the trend in the country and, and how the man in the White House is doing at the time. I'm sure you've thought about that. Is that a frustration to you or can that does that get you down at all? 
Well, you know, honestly, um, it doesn't get me down necessarily. Um, you know, this is a job I feel humbled and blessed to be able to have, you know, as, as a public school kid from my district, now be a congressman of the same district, I feel blessed. As you know, we've talked about it before. I've been a public servant my whole career. Um, so, you know, really, it just kind of comes down to the work that I'm going to do and, and you know, and what I feel like I'm able to deliver. Now, yes, you know, sometimes it's hard to get that across to people and communicate to people about what it is that I'm doing and what it is that I'm, I'm hoping to do. What I at least hope comes across to people in the district is whether they agree with my policies and my efforts or not, I, I hope that they uh, see my the, the earnestness with which I'm trying to do it. And, 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 and that's something that I, I hope at least cuts through so much of the noise that's out there right now in our politics. Yes, you're right. You know, I, I, I get attacked. I, I'm going to, this campaign's probably going to be one of the tougher ones. I'm one of only seven Democrats left in the country that represents the district that Trump won in 2020. So all those numbers, sure, I get it. I understand where people think about it. But on the other hand, I outperform President Biden by eight points in this district. And I think it shows that, that people are paying attention, that this isn't just about, you know, just the, the national atmosphere um, and the more th that I can just be out there in the district doing things like, you know, delivering for our veterans and, and trying to get, you know, their health care prioritized. You know, I hope people see that. And in and, and the same way that I talked about infrastructure and say, I got to take a look at it. I got to make my own decision. You know, I, I, I think the more I can show that I'm trying to do this, focus solely on the people of Burlington and Ocean County, not just doing whatever national folks say to do the more I can show that, that I stand out in that kind of way. And that's on me to try to make that case. And, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, and, and I'll do it the best I can. But look, whatever happens, whatever the voters decide, that's what I'll go with because that's how we need to make sure we move forward as a democracy. Sarah, thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Democratic New Jersey Congressman Andy Kim, still to come on Jersey Matters. 17 months later, and it is still nearly impossible to reach anybody about unemployment benefits by phone. And yet, there are hiring now signs everywhere you look. We'll have that story coming up next on Jersey Matters.